NASA iTech is a program that we have within the Space Technology Mission Directorate Office that searches for cutting edge technologies that are solving problems on Earth that also have the potential to be a solution for NASA and the space industry. What's unique about the NASA iTech program is that it operates in profoundly different, less traditional ways. They send out a technology call for applications to address specific NASA needs. We have our subject matter experts, our chief technologists, uh, provide uh, endorsement, and with that, um, work hand in hand with the, the uh, investors that are there. Entrepreneurs need courage to do what they do. They need to have quite a bit of endurance to be able to withstand the pressures of being an entrepreneur. And they really need an ecosystem in their surroundings to help them move that technology forward. Normally when you submit a proposal, you're never going to get the opportunity that you get to sit down with our chief technologist yeah. across our agency. And that's critical. It's critical for the entrepreneurs. The great thing just from sitting at, at the NASA iTech was looking how some, at how some of these technologies, even though they were geared for space, some of the technologies could be repurposed for different scientific challenges in the environment, in space, and medicine. How much better than having the CTO of a NASA center sitting with me talking to that technology? The access and really collaboration that we get as finalists has been incredibly helpful and creates an opportunity for us to solve problems. The beauty of it is those discussions are coming back with literally the technologists and the experts right now in the industry. We are building a network of data relay satellites that can help remote sensing satellites get more data to the ground and reduce latency. Where your Roomba and your drone have a kid, and the kid can disinfect the space station. So our system can process wastewater, just like it does in the body, and urine, so that you get clean, deliverable water to a community on the ground. Our team has developed a suite of patent-pending miniature robots that fit inside the pathways of the body. We provide lifelike motion for the next generation of robotics and automation. And I'm here to tell you about our needle-free jet injection technology. It's an exercise machine that grabs intelligent data from astronauts in a microgravity environment. We have designed a small, compact, lightweight apparatus for high contrast imaging of dim exoplanets next to bright stars. NASA iTech is reaching out to identify cutting-edge technologies that do have a commercial market value, but also can be customized to work within the space agency. We all benefit from that. Hello, and welcome to the first NASA iTech virtual, well, Ignite the Night. How about Ignite the Day? Um, we're glad that you are here to join us. Um, we have an incredible panel of judges that are here to evaluate some of the presentations of our entrepreneurs. And I think during this time, like this difficult time that our country is going through, we need something inspirational. And, and we need to hear from people that are still developing amazing technologies that have a great purpose for uh, solving problems on Earth and being a solution for us in space. And so today we've gathered together. We didn't want to miss a beat. We gathered together with our entrepreneurs and they're going to do, they're going to provide some uh, video presentations. You're going to get to hear from our panel of judges um, engaging with the entrepreneurs. And then we're going to select the top winner from today's presentations that will advance as a semifinalist into our um, Ignite the Night Cycle One Forum that'll we possibly take place in July. And um, we're trying to adjust with the times, but I thank you for joining us. I hope that you enjoy today's show and, um, and that you'll be back to join us for future ones. So I'm Kira, well, I was gonna say, I'm Kira Blackwell and I'm the program executive for NASA iTech. I work in the Space Technology Mission Directorate Office at NASA headquarters, but here I'm talking to you out of my home today. So um, if you want to connect with me through LinkedIn or Twitter, um, you know, there are the, uh, the, the, there's the information. So I hope again that you'll join us, you'll, en you'll enjoy this enough that you'll join us again. Next slide. So this is what you can look forward to today. This is our schedule. Um, the list of the presenters in in order in which those presentations will be um, 
will be given. And um, so basically we're going to, I'm gonna let you meet the judges very quickly. And then we're gonna start it off, kick it off with our entrepreneurs and their pitches. And then after they give their pitches, we're going to have the judges um, do some Q and A. So they're gonna ask additional questions so that they can tally their scores. Um, you can't engage, although the entrepreneurs can. You can certainly, um, you know, enjoy the enjoy the engagement that you'll see. But uh, at the end of the day, like you know, I hope that you get to see some amazing technologies like we have through all of this. So, for those of you that are joining for the first time, we search for advances in technology that are not really already funded by NASA that are solving problems on Earth and have the potential to address existing uh, challenges for us, for NASA. Um, often an entrepreneur is developing their technology and they're doing it for a specific purpose and they don't always think about the other applications or dual uses for those technology, which is why we started Ignite the Night is because often you can develop something that might be able to solve one problem but can also be used to solve another. And so what makes NASA iTech unique? We have plenty, we have lots of programs throughout the agency, but with NASA iTech, we one, we align the technology with, with NASA that also is meeting commercial needs. So the technologies that come through here, their primary focus is addressing a commercial need or solving a problem on Earth. When we see the technology, we identify ways in which it can also be useful for us. So the goal for us is to actually you know, eventually be able to sort of buy it off the shelf like we might an, I, we might an iPad and be able to uh, look at that technology and see ways in which we might modify it for our own purposes within the agency. So we go out and we find the innovators. We normally go out physically and find the innovators, go into cities, searching for entrepreneurs. But with, uh, with being um, isolated or restricted from getting out, this was the best that we could do. So I hope that, I hope it works. Um, applying, we made it very simple. We convene the right people. We bring in investors that would be interested in investing in that technology, as well as um, helping it move forward so that, again, it'll be readily available for NASA when we need it. And then basically we get out of their way. So we identify the problems that we have. We list them out there, but then we open it up for entrepreneurs to tell us, hey, you know, we have a technology that might be useful that you haven't thought of. Um, we also reduce IP concerns because at the current time, we do not invest uh, federal dollars in the development of the technology. Um, and so that helps. And then it's a five page white paper. We wanted to make it simple enough that if you could talk about your technology in a five page, page white paper, you would be ready for NASA iTech. And so these are our focus areas for the cycle two. Just to give you an idea of focus areas that we are looking for. And these are our numbers. Like this is this is what's what we've achieved as a team as we've worked with these entrepreneurs. The bottom line is is the entrepreneurs that have participated in NASA iTech have been able to leverage over half a million dollars in what two and a half years that they've been able to participate, and that's non-federal dollars, and that's that's pretty significant. And that tells you that the entrepreneurs that that we're working with also have a strong commercial market application because often investors aren't going to invest in something because they want to give the federal government more of their, do their dollars, right? So that half a million dollars is private investment dollars. And so this is kind of what a cycle looks like. We have them in various cities. We search throughout the United States, hold these events, looking for entrepreneurs that are in remote areas that aren't necessarily the Silicon Valley of the world. Although we found that those entrepreneurs um, still exist everywhere. And so we go into a city, search for them, bring in investors, and then those three city events sort of funnel into what our forum looks like. And then we pick the best of the best, the best 10 that will present at our forum. And so this is kind of an example of just what our, our cycle looks like. And this is where, from the time we began this program, which was, we kicked it off in December of 2016, these are the states that we have entrepreneurs that have come from, like all these states throughout the United States. So we've had entrepreneurs from all these states that have participated in our program. And there's just some of their logos. <laughs> so quite a few entrepreneurs. And so these are examples of entrepreneurs that we're working with. And I'm gonna just highlight a couple, like for example, Germ Falcon, they're currently addressing some of the um, 
the issues with coronavirus, believe it or not. They actually can disinfect planes. Um, they can also disinfect the space station. So like you saw in the video, it can actually dock itself, undock itself. So we're currently working with HEO um, to try and get them on a, on a flight demonstration to test their technology. Although we know they use UVC light. So UVC light can kill um, bacteria and viruses. It's a proven technology. It's what's used in surgical rooms now. It's, but for them, they have the ability to disinfect planes with that. And in addition to that, in their testing chambers, this is kind of cool, they're donating the use of their testing chambers to local hospitals in Orange County, California, so that people that have to reuse any of their PPE equipment, they can actually disinfect it up to 50 masks in about one minute. So I think that's, that's very cool. Um, but they're finding ways, I've noticed, they're finding ways in which they can work with um, either the, you know, medical institutions to try and help and address some problems. But some of these companies have, you know, either raised, you know, over four and a half million dollars for FGC Plasma or Enduralock, who's, who's working with other branches of the federal government. Um, and so there's, so it's, it's cool to see that as someone develops a technology, they had a different uh, mo mindset on where that technology was going to go. And they applied for NASA iTech. And now we're, we're able to see where that technology can actually be useful for the agency, but also move forward in solving the other problems. And so these are our upcoming Ignite the Night events that are virtual. So the ones that we have in yellow, um, we colored all of those uh, yellow so that Kira could, could remember them. But we'll have one coming up again in April. April 22nd, we'll do another virtual. We'll have one in May that's going to be virtually in San Francisco. And then we're going to have like one in Ohio that's going to be in June. So what we've done is we've we've just adjusted how we would normally do this. Instead of having our forums, we've decided to move all the Ignite the Nights virtual up. And then we've moved our forums back so that the forums are two days and it's the best 10 of, of all of the Ignite the Nights. And so we wanna make sure that you have the best opportunity to engage with the investors, um, the, our chief technologists that will be there. And so, so that's why we kind of adjusted the schedule based on the times. So now I'm gonna pass it off to our judges to be able to introduce themselves. What I have to say is this is an amazing panel of people. We are very fortunate to have them here and participating. And without their uh, help, we couldn't do this. And so what I've done is when we developed NASA iTech, we thought it would be good to have half of the judging panel to be from NASA, um, from, a, from a NASA perspective, being able to evaluate the technology, but the other half to be non-NASA, to be investors or, or tech experts in that field that can talk about from an investment perspective, how, if they would invest in it, why they would invest with, in it. So both of us are learning from each other. So I would say that, you know, the chief technologists have learned from um, the other panel of judges, like why or what's important to them, uh, to them in order for them to invest, as well as they've learned from us what's important to NASA and why we look at the technology from that perspective or what we've done or what we've achieved or how far we are in that, that sort of technology development within the agency. And so it brings together this panel of judges that are able, I feel like, to actually evaluate the technologies um, very well. So I'm going to hand it off to, I think, Robin, so she can introduce our first. Uh, Joshua Bayer from Capital Factor. Hi there. Uh, well, thanks for having me, uh, NASA and Kira and everyone else on the call uh, or on the video. Um, it's uh, this is not my I think this is my second or third time uh, doing a NASA iTech event. And so I'm a third. So I'm so glad to be here and my first time doing it virtually. And just like everyone else has been adapting to you know this new normal, I'm really glad to see but not surprised that NASA is on the cutting edge and keeping things moving forward because as much as we all need to do everything to uh, respect the social distancing and protect ourselves, we also need to keep the economy moving forward. And, and this is a really important part of it. So I'm really glad to be here uh, and excited to hear about all these uh, interesting new companies. And Bill Bastido. 
Hi, I'm, I'm Bill Bastido from Deloitte. I'm currently from Deloitte. I've been involved with NASA programs since the early 80s, uh, including 10 years as a civil servant at uh, first at NASA headquarters at the Reston Space Station Program Office, uh, also at uh, uh, the Kennedy Space Center, involved with both the Space, space Shuttle Program and the ELV programs, and then at the Johnson Space Center when we were busy building the early pieces of the International Space Station. Um, some people know me for 16 years. After my NASA career, I uh, led the NASA, the NASA business at Booz Allen Hamilton and uh, built up a very small business to a large business. So I think I bring a perspective of both what it takes to actually develop and, and build things along with what it takes to develop and build a business. And currently I'm with Deloitte, uh, focused on NASA programs as well. And next we have John Dankovich. There you go. So, uh, yeah, great. I'm excited to participate. Uh, actually, uh, originally I wasn't able to travel to Austin, but uh, I'm excited to be able to participate uh, virtually. So I'm the chief technologist at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, where we focus on uh, propulsion, life support systems, advanced manufacturing, and uh, just excited to participate in this one again. Thank you. Next is Ricardo de Blasio. Hello, everyone. This is Ricardo de Blasio. I'm one of the veterans of NASA Tech. Maybe that's why I have a vet uh, hat on my head. Uh, but I'm also the chief operating officer at Convolt. Uh, we are a leader in data protection uh, and uh, business continuity. Uh, we are a public company, ticker is CVLT. And on top of that, I'm also uh, a venture capital uh, partner of Day One Venture out of San Francisco and uh, also one of the advisor of Oryx Venture out of Dubai. Thank you for having me. Rich Godwin. Hi, my name is Rich Godwin. Thank you to the team for putting this together. I think this is awesome to do this. Uh, I am the founder and founding member of Space Technology Holdings, which is ostensibly a space development, a business development corporation uh, with space derived and designed technologies, which we then wrap resources around and bring to market. I'm also one of the founding members of Starbridge Venture Capital, which is a space-focused uh, um, venture capital fund. And uh, it's just a delight and an honor to be here. Glad to, glad to be part of the team. Peter Hughes. Glad to be here. This is Peter Hughes and the Chief Technologist at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Goddard specialty within the, the NASA family is in the robotic spacecraft, mainly in the science area. Um, we also do space comm and nav and in space assembly. I'm looking forward to these presentations and learning about these exciting emer new emerging technologies and how we could uh, use them to help us achieve our mission. Thank you. The next up is Terry Hilburn. Uh, my name is Terry Kilburn. I'm a founding partner, retired founder of, of uh, Avis & Young, which was a commercial real estate company. When I, when I started it, we started it. It was small, and now I think it's uh, fourth or fifth in the world. And uh, I enjoy these sessions with NASA and with the other judges. This is my second time as a judge, and I'm very happy to be here. That's it for me. Thank you. Richard Manassi. Hi, all. Dr. Richard Manassi. Uh, hello from Tampa, Florida. Uh, glad to be a part of uh, this month's iTech program, even though it's virtual. Definitely miss seeing everybody's faces and uh, meeting up in person. I am the director of the Tampa Bay Wave Technology Accelerator. I'm also a founder of Blackfin Technology Partners. I sit on the advisory board for South by Southwest Pitch. I'm a mentor from Ash Challenge, and I do a couple of other things focused on startups in the early stage. Looking forward to hearing all of today's participants and looking forward to uh, scoring today's event. Next is Harry Partridge. Hello, I'm Harry Partridge. I'm the Chief Technologist at NASA Ames. Uh, my degree is in chemical physics, and I'm looking forward to um, to judging the competition today. Uh, AIMS uh, focus is on um, uh, robotics, uh, life detection, uh, autonomy, 
uh, software development and supercomputing. And finally, Ramona Travis. Hi, yes, Ramona Travis here from the Stennis Space Center where I serve as the Center Chief Technologist. Uh, Stennis is the nation's largest rocket engine test complex where we also do uh, a fair bit of work with autonomous systems. I've been involved in iTech since the beginning of the program almost three and a half years ago. Look forward to today. So if that didn't scare the entrepreneurs, you shouldn't be scared, they're great. But it's a great panel of judges and it, they come from a broad perspective of backgrounds. So it's really amazing for me to see the interaction that they have with the entrepreneurs. So I think at this point, I'm gonna ask all of the judges to mute their mics. Um, you can keep your camera on if you want, but just if you can mute your mics, we're going to kick off the first presentation. And so first up, we have neural nutrition. If we're not in top health, if our astronauts aren't in top health, can we truly utilize the incredible technology around us to its full potential? I'm Jeff Kershell, co-founder and president of Neural Nutrition, and we believe our product science can act as powerful countermeasures in offsetting some of the greatest challenges NASA faces. The influence of microgravity on muscle atrophy, bone decalcification, and the daily blood chemistry of our astronauts. My background is in sports science and human performance, and combined with our incredible neural nutrition science team, we have an unmatched understanding of nutrient bioavailability, the glycemic index, glycemic load, and the insulin index. Our science team has been awarded a number of patents and has been accredited for the discovery and patents for safe arginine formulation. We also have a strong interest in boosting the immune system, in weight management, and in sport performance. Here's what we know. Our NASA performance drinks will provide fuel for the daily efforts of our astronauts. Formatted with our proprietary key code fuel, which is a unique blend of slow-release burnable carbohydrates that minimize blood sugar swings, providing consistent and sustained energy to the brain and body. Our first performance drink was specific to baseball and was released in 2019. It was the official drink of the baseball and softball Olympic qualifying tournaments and was used by Major League Baseball in the Arizona Fall League. Players reported they experienced more energy, less foggy mind, and better recovery. In an interesting finding from our clinical trials, a dose of only seven to eight grams of our key code fuel, 30 minutes prior to consuming an extremely high glycemic beverage, significantly reduced the glycemic response in our subjects. We also know that while in space, our astronauts will lose one to 2% of their bone mass per month. Our bone and joint strategy can help. It's an integrated bone formula with multiple minerals like boron and three different forms of calcium. And we also know that astronauts can experience a 20% loss of muscle mass on short flights lasting only one to 11 days. Our arginine product for nitric oxide and growth hormone has been safely formulated and could substantially impact the loss of muscle mass in space. Meanwhile, here on Earth, we're collectively spending hundreds of millions of dollars on diet and weight loss solutions, while at the very same time, the estimated cost of obesity and obesity-related illnesses eclipsed $1.7 trillion back in 2018. So, with the backing of board-approved human in vivo clinical trials and a safety record of use in over 250,000 humans with not one single reported side effect, we're currently looking for strategic partners to join us as we look for opportunities to license certain products and to invest as we continue to roll out our branded product line. We hope you'll join us on this critical mission to support health and performance for the benefit of all. Thank you for your consideration. Next up is Alma Technologies. My name is Kay. 
and I'm a co-founder and CEO of Oma Technologies from Dallas, Texas. I'm here to present you with the world's first permanent magnet-based precision tracking system. This is our portable magnetic fuel generator, which is about the size of an apple. With this at the center, we get about a one meter tracking radius in all directions by rotating the permanent magnet inside in a very unique way. Within this spherical tracking zone, we can track tiny sensors that measure as small as 0.8 millimeter with some millimeter precision. By embedding or attaching these sensors to different objects or parts of our bodies, we can collect extremely precise location and orientation data of these sensors. This data is used for many applications such as virtual or augmented reality simulations, robotics control, tool tracking, performance measurements, and many more. While we are pursuing all types of industries, we found our greatest success in healthcare, where last year we signed with one of the world-leading healthcare companies to co-develop and market our system. Our partner has more than 4,000 legacy position tracking systems installed in hospitals across all major markets. And their systems handle more than 250,000 cases per year, which in turn consumes one to two million sensors every year. This worldwide installation base and the massive recurring sensor sales potential has helped us raise more than $2.5 million today. For those who might be asking, so who cares about this? The position tracking systems are foundational because of whatever approach you choose, everything else must be built on top of it, from physical tools, to software, to certifications. So replacing them at a worldwide scale is a massive undertaking. And there is a good reason why our partner has embraced such a fledgling approach built by a small startup like this. Simply put, the old position tracking technologies, such as using cameras, IMUs, or electromagnets, fail in one scenario or another. And they haven't seen meaningful innovation in decades. Despite our short history, we not only match the tracking performance of these approaches, but can also overcome their fundamental limitations to handle all types of scenarios, even in space. In fact, our latest patent took less than six months from submission to being granted. In the time when patents are often filed for the sake of being filed, this is a resounding confirmation of the innovation and the benefits of our approach. The potential use case of our system for NASA are many, from tracking tools during spacewalk helping to perform medical operations, either in person or remotely from Earth. Precision tracking can be easy to overlook, but it can also easily be the foundation of a successful space mission. So if you're looking for medical grade precision with versatility and portability to match, OMO is your choice. Autonomic is next. How long has it been since you went to the airport counter to buy tickets? When was the last time you had to wait at the curb for a taxi ride? Not in a long time. Thanks to software, it has made our life easier and convenient. But it has become so convenient that when it fails, our life is disrupted. This isn't just personal. There are dramatic business implications due to software outages. In the last year alone, over 3.6 billion people have been affected by our software outages. The economic impact is in excess of $1.7 trillion. This is huge. In fact, in the space technology industry, a unit conversion bug resulted in a loss of $125 million for the NASA Mars Climate Orbiter Program. A regression software bug resulted in an $8.5 billion loss for Europe's Alien 5 program. By the time we finish this pitch, there is a high probability that one in three of you would have been impacted by a software outage. Why does this happen? The fundamental reason is there just isn't enough time, investment, or resources to test software. The verification and validation of software today is extremely manual, almost 95%.
and this situation is only going to get worse. We are projecting an explosion of software applications to hit over a trillion applications globally in the next three to five years. We just cannot continue with the current approach and expect a better outcome. My name is Ram Shanmugam. I am the founder and CEO of Autonomy, and along with my co-founder Raj Rao and the brilliant team of scientists from UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz have harnessed the power of AI to develop the industry's first autonomous software package. Using NLP, machine vision, behavioral trees, and neural networks, we have dramatically improved the speed, the comprehensiveness, and the completeness of testing while reducing the dependency on human effort. Today, over 600,000 software engineers working across the world are using our autonomous software platform for testing their applications. Some of the world's leading companies like Honeywell, Toyota, Johnson Controls, Verizon, and several others have seen a 20 to 25% reduction in software outages and an improvement of 70 to 80% in speed of software testing. We are continuing to extend autonomous capabilities in our product beyond testing to find fixes for the software outage. Like other industries, we see a huge opportunity for autonomous verification and validation in space technology applications. As the applications of space technology evolve, to support use cases like commercial space flights, space tourism, manned planetary missions, the need for software verification and validation is going to increase tremendously. The cost of software outages is just too high to believe. And we believe our autonomous testing platform can help NASA play a leadership role in this area. Thanks for the opportunity to share our vision and practice with you today. Stay safe. Next up, we have MACLA Technical Project Laboratory. Yes, that's true. Electricity is the most important blessings of science and without electricity, one cannot even dream about modern lifestyle. Solar, wind and similar technologies are inherently infirm and subject to intermittency with seasonal and diurnal variation, which limit the scope of these technologies on Earth as well as in the space. Conventional hydropower plants are most vulnerable to natural disasters and their irreversible impact to nature and local livelihood is well known. Namaskar. I am Balram, along with Narayan, we are the scientists famous as Bharadwaj brothers, having 15 years of experience in environment and mechanical engineering respectively, being born and brought up in a remote village of India, our everyday challenge of rural life ignited the zeal of innovation in our childhood itself, which converted into passion and later on become our full-time profession, when we incorporated Mac -like in 2014. At New Delhi. With more than 3,000 gigawatts of global potential, we identified hydrokinetics as one of the least explored sector. Yes, MacLake emerges as the only startup in India who invented altogether different indigenous technology that's SHK turbines. Apart from eight national awards, SHK turbines is recognized by World Wildlife Fund as a climate solver technology and as the world's best GHG reduction technology by European Union last year. So far, we installed more than 60 field trials, get certified by IIT Roorkee and many net organizations. We are revenue positive, raised more than a million dollars, currently installing first 100 kilowatt plant and have more than 100 megawatts worth of order under pipeline from across India, as well as from Australia, Netherlands, Bhutan, Ethiopia, and Zambia. Why? Because with less than 1500 US dollar per kilowatt capex, lowest opex, two cent per kilowatt hour wind generation cost, our turbines is most affordable, modular, scalable, replicable, relocatable, debris free, simplest yet robust regeneration systems, which is easy to fabricate, transport, assemble, install with a negligible structure to harness energy from running waters of rivers, canals, rivulets, tidal streams, having at least 0.5 meter per second velocity and just 0.4 meter depth. As pressure aerator, SHK turbines also capable to harness power from sewage drains and to treat sewage water by enhancing dissolved oxygen and normalize BOD COD levels. Patented blade profile, more than 20 different variants of specific site parameters, the SHK turbines are different in fundamental working principle from all existing hydro turbines available now and make it suitable for all kinds of fluids on Earth's space probes. 
the travel much beyond mars need more power than solar cell can provide which ranges from 5 to 10 kilowatts the interstellar space station uses 100 kilowatt for onboard systems with small modifications our turbine can utilize individually or in hybrid condition with solar to provide power for both propulsion and operation in space mission MacLeck, with his years of practical experience and proven innovation tech record, determined to work with NASA to explore the unexplored field of energy generation in space and in Earth to support space missions and help the mankind. Thank you. Presenting next is LVX system. LVX Li-Fi. Using LED technology, we light space with great efficiency and with the same modulating photons, transmit high-speed wireless data, like fiber optics without the fiber. It's fiberless. LVX is the inventor, patent holder, an innovator in this new technology communication medium known as light fidelity or LIFI. I'm David Sexton, CEO of LVX System, a Florida-based company with offices and labs at Kennedy Space Center and service operations in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Wi-Fi uses radio waves. LIFI uses the visible light spectrum. Experts say comparing bandwidth of Wi-Fi to LIFI is like comparing the mass of the earth to the sun. Think about it, harmless light communication medium that is so much faster. It has a very controlled footprint, making it very secure and difficult to jam or hack. Its bandwidth can be allocated from room to room, making the data throughput virtually unlimitless, with the very same light we need to see. In a Space Act agreement between LVX and NASA, we successfully developed certain features of Wi-Fi, and both NASA and LVX personnel were left with the overwhelming realization of many uh, aerospace implications. Applications like cabin lighting and communication, reduced RF emissions, wiring complexities and weight, communication and control redundancies, energy and heat reductions impervious to interference, and, and many more making it an amazing viable augmentation to commu aerospace communication. Wi-Fi is a critical enabling technology for the new communication ecosystem. It can support secure data needs in smart cities, uh, smart power grids, AI, virtual reality, and autonomous vehicles. As cell phones became smartphones with endless apps, living environments will do the same with great cost reductions, more efficient apps that will enhance our human experience. We at LVX have developed this technology to, to a commercialized state. LVX provides uh, Wi-Fi as a utility-like service. By replacing fluorescent lamps with LVX lamp, LVX sells communicating light in a metered energy unit called the data lumen hour, similar to a kilowatt hour. Further research will forward our development in Wi-Fi. However, its vast potential has barely, has barely been scratched. It's limitless. Thank you. Next up, we have NanoPrecise Science Corporation. Hi, implementing RCM at a single NASA Central Air Station saved $300,000 and can save up to $100 billion per annum globally. RCM is a correlation between machine process parameters and response parameters. 
NASA currently monitors process parameters, but as for our knowledge, does not have a system that gathers all the high resolution machine response parameters with a single wireless device. Cisco study says that 75% of the IoT based predictive or prescriptive maintenance projects have failed due to data quality and feature correlation issues. I'm Sunil, founder of NanoPrecise, located in Edmonton, Canada, and we are addressing this very issue with a totally automated approach that uses IoT-based hardware plus AI-based software. Our hardware, called Machine Doctor, is the world's first and only wireless device to measure all the machine response parameters such as speed, surface temperature, vibration, acoustic, and humidity with high resolution. It serves the needs of 75% of the market and has all the required certification, including Zone Zero. Our software platform called Rotation Life is a sensor agnostic, can take data from NASA's existing data lakes and co can correlate that with our sensor data parameters to provide a totally automated RCM. We offer our solution in a SaaS model. Our total addressable market size is $15.6 billion and we are focused on North America and Asia Pacific. So how are we special? It's our patent pending approach in which we firstly use acoustic emission and temperature analytics to detect anomaly. Once anomaly is identified, high resolution vibration data is correlated with instantaneous machine speed data to decompose multiple fault modes and predict remaining time to failure due to each fault mode. With this approach, we recently achieved $1 million in potential unplanned downtime savings on the reciprocating compressors for our oil and gas customer. Our go-to-market strategy is to reach out to end customers such as Chevron, Exxon, etc., either directly or through distributors. Based on success with case study about specific equipment, we reach out to those OEMs. Finally, we would like to reach out to system integrators such as IBM Maximo that NASA already utilizes. Comparing ourselves with established players such as SKF, Emerson, ABB, we have features such as correlating machine speed with high resolution acoustic or vibration data that no one else has set yet in the price range that we are offering. Since we founded in 2018, January, we raised $3 million are a strong team of 23 spread across two continents. We have an installed base of 1,500 sensors, have 16 paid customers, including Chevron, Tata, Nutrien, etc. We achieved a $1 million contract with a single customer in January 2020. We have reached $0.7 million ARR in March and will reach $1.5 million ARR by the end of this year. To accelerate this growth, we are looking forward to NASA as a true large-scale customer. We are also raising $5 million to rapidly expand our sales and develop new features for our, in our software. Thank you. Next is Spira. Quarantine, a time when you're stuck at home with your family for weeks. Sounds like a pretty terrible game show idea, doesn't it? And it's a lot like what living in space would be like. You're gonna be stressed, you won't be able to go outside, but a key difference is that you could sit in your house right now in your underwear and pretty much order anything that you want and expect it to be delivered to you within a matter of days or hours. Space doesn't have that luxury. Hi, I'm Surgeon Singh, CEO of Spira. Spira creates protein-based ingredients that replace petroleum and animal compounds in the supply chain. We genetically engineer photosynthetic organisms to produce these ingredients in San Pedro, California, with the goal of growing throughout the solar system. Our core technology allows us to make designer proteins at scale sustainably. Take our first product, for example, a protein-based blue colorant derived from spirulina algae that we like to call electric sky that can replace petroleum-based blue dyes. These blue dyes are used in everything from Gatorade to blue jeans. Our clients in food, cosmetics, and textiles will be able to use our protein ingredients without changing anything at all about their current processes. We make a few thousand dollars monthly pilot testing our ingredients with small brands initially to trial run our protein-based ingredients and use that data to sell ingredients to larger companies. 
Currently, we have 12 pilot clients and 40 letters of intent. This overwhelming demand is both for our protein-based blue colorant and for the variety of other protein ingredients we will, be able, we will be able to offer using algae. To make these ingredients, we work with a global network of algae farmers. Right now, we have 14 farms that have the capacity to grow over 20 metric tons of biomass. By working with farmers in these developing countries, we absorb tons of CO2, cut down on operating costs, and maintain flexibility in our supply chain. What this means is that we have the ability to apply this technology to tailor photosynthetic organisms to not only produce food in space, but also make medicine, clothes, plastics, fuel, and other important items for prolonged human habitation beyond Earth, all powered by the sun. This means reducing the payload of future colonies to a fraction of what it would be right now. To make this possible, we've assembled a team of bioengineers, chemists, business leaders, advised by the best in food, synthetic biology, and emerging space technologies. We are currently raising $2 million, with a quarter of it already committed, to grow our bioengineering team in IP and expand our sales efforts into the cosmetics marketplace. If you are interested in the future of bioproduction in space or would like to support our efforts in commercializing algae-based production, please, email me at surge at spiritinc.com. Thank you. Finally, we have Firehawk Aerospace. My name is Will Edwards, and I'm the CEO of Firehawk Aerospace. And we built the safest, most reliable, and cost-effective rocket engine in the world. While there have been incredible advancements in aerospace technology, rocket engines have been left behind. We're still using engines based on designs from the 1960s that utilize unstable fuel and oxidizer combinations. Due to the high volatility, these rocket engines take five to seven years to design. They cost hundreds of millions of dollars in investments. They have hundreds, if not thousands of parts, and they're still unreliable. Our hybrid rocket engine only has 12 parts, which means there's far less likely for something to go wrong. They can be designed in four to six months. They will not accidentally detonate, and they have nearly unlimited thrust scalability. On top of that, they cost 20% of the standard rocket engine. So we've achieved this by 3D printing our rocket fuel instead of the traditional method of cast molding. This creates a much more sturdy grain that will not break apart or generate excessive amounts of vibration, which has historically prevented hybrids from coming to market. So our fuel is made up of an ABS thermoplastic and nanoaluminum powder. We use nitrous oxide as our oxidizer, and since our engine utilizes an oxidizer valve, our fuel grain can throttle down to 10%, and our specific impulse is in the 320s. To date, we have 31 hot fire engine tests to back up our data and have been awarded five patents, giving us a monopoly on the 3D printing of rocket fuel. Our engine can also be produced using robotics. It has multiple applications, including lunar landers, small sat launchers, and hypersonic missiles with intercept capabilities. In fact, Stennis and Marshall Space Center approached us about working together on a 25,000 pound thrust version of our engine for a lunar transport system. They're intrigued due to the fact that our fuel is capable of being printed on the moon using lunar resources. Currently, the best option for that is a hydrogen-based liquid bipropellant engine. But you can't store hydrogen on the moon for a month and expect to have the same amount left. It'll boil off. Our fuel will not boil off. Completing this alongside the engineers from two prestigious space centers will help give the latest iteration of our technology immediate validation. Firehawk is also gaining traction in the commercial sector. We're in negotiations to build our hybrid engine for a small sat launcher. They chose us due to our time frame, the customization, the safety, and the reusability of our engine. We're a proud team made up of engineers, government professionals, additive manufacturing experts, and startup founders. Therefore, we know what it takes to make this work. Can you imagine a world where you can have a custom engine on demand where you don't have to wait seven years to send up the latest 
innovative ship in the space, we can. So we're Firehawk Aerospace, and we're creating the safest, most reliable, and cost-effective rocket engine in the world. Thank you. So Kira Blackwell back again. So um, thank you to our entrepreneurs. I'm going to now uh, pass it off to our judges so that they can engage with the entrepreneurs and begin asking the questions. Our first judge that has three minutes, Robin again, is going to let you know when you have um, maybe 30 seconds left in your question session. So each judge has three minutes to ask questions. And so um, I'll hand it off to you, uh, Robin, so that you can introduce the first judge and they can begin asking the entrepreneurs questions. Do we have all the entrepreneurs on? If you're not talking, please mute your mic. You could definitely be on screen if you want your video on, but mute your mic if you're not. And so our first judge is Josh Baer from Capital Factory. Awesome. Well, I'm super glad I'm first. Uh, LEX, uh, tell me um, a little bit about um, is this, I, and I apologize because, you know, it, it's, we had to kind of hear this over the pitch. And so I feel like there's, I might've missed some details, but is this, is this two-way communication? Is it, is it going back and forth between, or, or is, is it one way from the light source? And then the kind of like with satellite going back a different way. Okay. It's a two-way communication medium. You just small, plug a small device like this uh, into your computer which is uh, com uh, communicating with an LED to transmit and a photodiode to receive. And it communicates with the uh, lights, like the ones you see above my head. And these lights become access points to the internet. So it's two-way communication. We're building a network within the, within the facility. We can hook up to the lights with broadband over power line or Cat5 cabling. That's great. It's almost like X10 going over power lines, but even better. Um, so are you... Um, when you do that, is it directional? Like, is it just broadcasting everywhere or is it almost like lasers talking to each other or could it be? It's, it's kind of in between. So right now we've got to choke down to about uh, 20 degrees, which actually helps. So one of the biggest problems with communication is congestion, which limits our bandwidth. So if you can confine light and communication to a small space, you can substantially increase the throughput. For example, light doesn't go from room to room, so already you've increased the throughput. And then these lights, for example, are communicating down at about a 15 degree angle, covering the whole room. And you know, next generations will will go even farther. So you can do indirect communication as well. Awesome, really cool. Um, let's see. Uh, next question for. Um, the for OMO technologies and the precision tracking. Um, what's your um, top immediate use case? Like, where are you getting the most traction right now? I see there's a bunch of places it could apply, but like, what's the use case that's, you know, where it's getting the most traction? Yeah, uh, so I think I highlighted during the presentation, unfortunately, I can't reveal our partner or the specific use case, but it's in healthcare. Um, so, uh, like I said, uh, but I can tell you in terms of it's for surgical navigation and physical rehabilitation related. Um, so you can't uh, imagine. So it kind of generally help right, right now, kind of precise healthcare is the, the spot that's um, that where you're getting the, the most traction. Um, yes. Okay. Um, and. Uh, and that's time. Okay. Thank you. All right, couldn't do more. All right, Boswell, well, thanks. And the next judge is Bill Bastido. Okay, um, for Firehawk, um, can your technology be scaled up uh, large enough to support a large uh, launch vehicle? Uh, yes, we can. We can scale up to 100,000 pounds of thrust. Um, also, what you traditionally can't do with hybrids is we can cluster it. We have clustering abilities with our engine. 
Great, thanks. Um, for neural nutrition, uh, do you have um, data backing up the claims the benefit astronauts would receive from your uh, um, from your uh, sports drink? So, so we have data from trials on athletes and uh, subjects that looked at the glycemic index. So we do have data. Uh, we tried to share as much of that as possible in our uh, white papers and here. Uh, we have no problem sharing it, but we're really, really interested to see how we might be able to manipulate the formulas to help the athletes in space, microgravity, and namely the radiation as well. Great, thank you. And uh, uh, LVX again, uh, have you been able to determine over what distances you can be able to effectively communicate using light? So uh, light can communicate far distances we for commercial applications are actually looking at shorter distances because constraining light actually decreases uh, congestion and increases bandwidth. But with white lasers, they're, they're uh, communicating great distances. We're, we're focused on for commercial applications, again, constraining. All right, thank you. And lastly, for atomic, autonomic, um, what benefits do you specifically see that the space industry would get from a more efficient, more um, precise um, uh, software test. So to be able to catch issues and bugs before you launch a system or launch an application. Uh, so if you're launching, a, I gave an example of a regression error that uh, was caught in the, Spark State, the, the Mars lander program. If you had caught that bug before you launched, you would have saved $125 million. So the cost of poor quality is extremely high uh, once you launch something. So we want to catch those before you launch. All right, that wraps it up for me. Thank you. Thank you. The next judge is John Dankovich. Yeah, thanks, Robin. So uh, my first question was for uh, Nano Precise. Um, uh, do, you, uh, do you know how long it takes to train on a new uh, system before it knows how well the degradation will be graceful, otherwise if it'll be maintenance over a long period of time or how urgent the maintenance is required, for example, a new vacuum pump or a scroll pump? Yeah, so we have uh, through our algorithms, we have uh, minimum that we have seen is with a one week of data, after five days of training, we were able to predict what is happening, what will happen in the next two to three days. And that was uh, almost like more than 99% uh, correct. Do you have any data to also back up um, as opposed to doing uh, what we do is time-based maintenance in terms of uh, offset savings that we would expect? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, could you please repeat your question? I, I couldn't understand that. Yeah. Sure. So a lot of times we'll use time-based maintenance. So, you know, after two years of pump operation, then we'll go ahead and have it refurbished. Um, mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't showing any signs of de degradation. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, how much maintenance costs we could actually save um, if we only perform maintenance on degraded equipment. Yes, we do. We do have the data uh, on, on that. So it it all depends on, uh, you know, what's the uh, MTBF, uh, you know, usual MTBF, but we don't, uh, you know, depend on that. We just need that to have an estimate. And uh, it, it all depends on how much it can, uh, the downtime on that specific equipment can cost. So we can, we can definitely share, share the numbers and the data. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And so our next judge is Ricardo de Blasio. Yes, hi. Uh, so the first question uh, is for uh, Nano Precise again. Uh, I'm wondering if you guys have uh, any other example outside the oil and gas. Where do you see the, the biggest opportunity outside that industry? What's the number two? What's the number three? And then, yes. sorry, if, uh, if I may, uh, one more question, you know uh what's the overall industry looks like right who are you trying to disrupt who are you competing you know when you close a business with chevron are you taking someone out so you you chasing an existing budget or are you creating a new market and therefore you don't have competition because you you're creating a problem the customer doesn't know to have 
Yeah, to answer the first question, uh, one good example is the wind turbine. Uh, and uh, so wind turbine, uh, you know, the problem is a very uh, detecting uh, faults at a very low speed. So that's where, you know, uh, having all these like uh, monitoring RPM, acoustic, vibration, all with a single device and very sophisticated signal processing algorithms apart from the AI algorithms are needed. So that's one of, uh, and, and, you know, especially in the current field, you know, uh, reducing the O&M cost per wind turbine really helps them compete with the natural gas. So we have a LOI for 2,000 sectors. It's one of the largest uh, wind, wind power sector in India. Uh, to answer the second question, so as I said, machine uh, process parameters like pressure, temperature, flow rate, what, what goes inside the machine are already being monitored by SCADA and PCA, uh, DCS and all that. But what are not uh, being monitored with high resolution accuracy are the machine response parameters, like how it vibrates, how much sound it makes, at what speed it is making that sound, what's the magnetic flux, um, uh, leakage, you know. These have to be correlated with the you know, parameters inside. So what we are bringing is we are uh, you know, excelling in that and providing predictable maintenance and helping uh, you know, companies like you know, uh, um, larger uh, companies like IA, IBM or Maxim uh, SAP to do uh, overall you know, uh, autonomous uh, automated RCM, which is like overall package where you know, they optimize the operations based on the maintenance. And that's time. Hello. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Second question is for neural and nutrition. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, I, I want to congratulate for uh, the amazing video. When Robin sent out the video, I thought that was a commercial ad. So professionally done. Uh, <laughs> my, my question is, uh, uh, so I understand the application in the space environment, but uh kind of similar question i have for nano precise how the industry look like i, I struggle to understand a little bit what is your secret sauce where where's the ip uh, some, i mean looks i'm not an expert in the domain but i saw i you know, a lot of product that that do similar type of things so what's your uniqueness yeah i think our uniqueness is the years we've taken and the clinical trials we did that looked at blood glucose response to different products and what we learned early on and our science team learned early on that we if we could control the blood sugar and the biochemistry in the blood we could really help deliver nutrients better but also help the body function better so what we have got is a proprietary blend of carbohydrates that have a different a uh, number of different uh, sweetness levels, a number of different carbohydrates where we can calibrate it uh, to create an outcome. And I think, you know, the application, you know, in our sporting world is our sport specific uh, formulations, for example. So I think that sets us apart from anybody else on the market. And uh, we're hoping to, you know, have a massive impact on, on the health and wellness of, of people everywhere. Thank you. And then I don't know if I have that's questions. Time. Questions. Ricardo, I'm sorry. That's time. Don't worry. Don't worry. Our next Thank judge you. is Richard Godwin. Hey, guys. Um, first question for Spira. Uh, it's a very competitive environment, algal production. Uh, what are your input materials? Sure. So our input materials are, of course, inorganic carbon that makes about a half biomass. Uh, we're getting our inorganic carbon from bicarbonate as opposed to uh, dissolved CO2. So we have a pr proprietary approach to uh, capturing CO2 and converting it to bicarbonate, which is uh, about a thousand times more soluble, transportable, and storable than, than dissolved CO2. So our delivery mechanism for carbon uh, as, as a nutrient is, is, is superior to uh, many other applications that you've come across in the papers for algal cultivation. Uh, our, our, our nitrogen predominantly comes from um, anaerobic digestion of, 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 of dairy manure and food waste. Um, uh, we can also work with urea um, with, with our strain spirulina that we're focused on uh, cultivating. Uh, the phosphates uh, we're getting from settling out of the effluent coming out of the anaerobic digester. So uh, primarily the, the phosphates, carbon and um, nitrogen uh, make, up, make, make up the bulk of our, 
nutrients, but we do have also technology, uh, proprietary technology around uh, deriving uh, uh, basic monocyclides from lignocellulosic biomass using a, a proprietary uh, pretreatment method involving ionic solvents. Uh, so that, uh, that enables uh, nighttime cultivation in a heterotrophic uh, environment. So you should be able to make uh, quite a soup out of the uh, ISRU on Mars. You should be able to get a lot of your input. Too, so. <laughs> um, a second question is for LVX. Um, uh, how much data is available off reflected surfaces? I'm presuming you can get a lot off the reflected surfaces. And um, uh, so as opposed to direct line of sight. And the second part of that question is, uh, if it's that fast, how do computers, standard computers, keep up with that data flow? Okay, so we we have uh, gone down a hallway, bounced off a surface, and uh, and turned around a corner and and streamed a movie, but yeah, we have not uh, you know replicated that in a commercial application. So, um, but but again, because our, our lights connect and make a a more singular, more confined connection, even with a three megabit uh, device like this, you can stream a couple of movies and surf the internet simultaneously. So the constraint really isn't the speed. The constraint is feeding that much uh, bandwidth into the room, for example. So we're actually going to change the way people people define speed. You know, they'll be after less constraint. If you can get rid of the constraints, you can, you can handle a lot of speed. So fast forward, if you do need more speed, we, we will not be the constraining element. Uh, last question, neural nutrition. Um, you said that it's a bioavailable, the formula. Uh, I presume you've got some, quite a bit of data on that. How does it react with the gut biome? Any, any data you have on that? Yeah, so we really haven't tested the butt, uh, gut biome, but we haven't seen any, any uh, uh, negative effects in that in terms of absorption or, or stomach um, um, uh, reactions. So uh, we don't see any any issues there at all, and we haven't had any reported issues with our with our subjects. That's good. All right, and that is time. Our next judge is Peter Hughes. So where do you where do you want to fall in the value chain or the production life cycle for producing these proteins as we venture further away from Earth? into space and deeper uh, deeper endeavors and away from this planet? Yeah, so we, we sit at uh, pretty much the uh, bottom of the manufacturing chain in terms of protein production, uh, being able to then produce higher and higher value products. Um, in essence, what we can do is produce large amounts of proteins, and those proteins can be applied from anything to food, textiles, uh, cosmetics, uh, any any kind of usage that you can think of out of uh, algal culture that looks some, something like this. Um, that kind of production can then be used to produce higher value compounds such as uh, biotherapeutics, uh, vaccines, medicines, edible, edible medicines uh, later on. So initially we're at the very bottom level of all production of various goods and goods that are produced in the space-based scenario. Great, great answer, thank you. And for Firehawk Aerospace, um, what is the unique IP you own for this uh, propulsion design technology? We have the ability to 3D print our rocket fuel. We have five patents around the 3D printing of rocket fuel, which allows us to build a grain that has the topology to produce these results and to add aluminum powder to it, nano aluminum powder. Okay. And it sounds like it's a, it's a kind of a crowded space in this propulsion era, I would imagine. Um, are you partnering with other people to to, to uh, collaborate in a, you know any new unique offerings or new partners that would entice us all the more to support you? We sadly that you could share with us. Uh, we can't share that, but to give you a narrowness on actually the market, NASA just released a study saying that liquid um, hydrogen cryogenics are not the solution for the lunar um, landers, uh, and they're pretty much no other solutions to that. We actually do fit that since we don't have a liquidified hydrogen for our lunar landers. So that actually narrowed the market on that aspect. Right, and that's all I have, Robin. Thank you. Uh, Richard Manassi, your first question. 
Thank you, Robin. I have three questions. Uh, first question is for Maclick. Maclick, can you redefine your use case for NASA and the space program? Yeah, so in our case, so this is the simplest turbine module which can run through any any uh, fluid which is which is having velocity. So that's what we wanted to try this technology as a replacement of conventional wind turbines in space areas like in Venus and Mars where the storms are available. And it, it has the capability to, to act as a, as a hybrid technology with the help of solar along with it. So that's part of our uh, new SOP for space specs. Thank you very much. Uh, for neural nutrition, who developed a proprietary formula? Yeah, so our science team, our chief, uh, our chief um, um, of science has formulated these uh, over, over a number of years. When I came on and joined the team, of course, we learned more and modified uh, based on my background in human performance. So we have an incredible science team that's responsible for the formulation. Can you expand on that a little bit? When you say science team, what does that mean? Yeah, so we have a number of doctors involved and a number of researchers who I came across who were in the world of diabetes and blood chemistry when I came on. Um, and they were already producing products that I was interested in. And when we came together, we collaborated to modify and, and take the science to, to another level. And again, you know, our science team is an, a number of different people. Um, and uh, some of them prefer to stay anonymous at this time. Thank you very much. For Firehawk, can you go over your terrestrial use cases one more time, please? So we have the ability to provide uh, rocket engines for hypersonic missiles, first of their kind to be able to actually throttle and restart. We can provide um, launcher engines for small sats and then also for lunar landers and lunar transport uh, um, systems. So due to our low cost, small park count, we can actually get these done in under a year instead of a five to seven years. Have you had any movement around the missile side of things right now? Or is that a potential use case? Actually, yeah, we are working uh, with different companies that's very heavily uh, regulated, so we can't say anything more than that. No, that's just it's, fine, it's, thank uh, you new... so much. Yeah. That's my last question, Robin. Thank you. And so our next judge, Harry Partridge. Okay, so LVX. Uh, uh, two quick questions. Uh, what is your up speed and can you use it for gaming? <clears throat> so, because we have uh, 53 patents uh, awarded today in the area of visible light communication technology and data lumen powers as a service, and then um, patents in the area of spatial location and, uh, you know, leveraging fixed infrastructure, our focus is on commercial application streaming and communication and providing networks. So our goal is to make these lights above me uh, pay for themselves, unlike the cell tower, whether, whether they communicate or not. So we, we intend to license and collaborate with outside applications and development people to enhance all aspects of our technology. So current speed uh, are three megabits up and down. They're relatively slow. They're good for streaming and surfing the internet, but the, the technology we're using is older. We've actually focused our attention on building the business model, prepping for commercialization, and securing all our intellectual property. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm new, am I pronouncing it correctly? Um, what is the uh, size of the sensor and can you track in roars? Sorry, uh, are you talking about us, OMO Technologies? Yes. Uh, you, you said the size of the sensor and what was the other part? Can you track if something's in a drawer or a cabinet? Yes, that is one of the main benefits of our technology. Our sensors are 0.8 millimeters. So I wish I could show, but it's literally, you know, uh, it's one tenth the size of the regular rice grain, if you will. Um, so you can embed it into anything. Uh, you can put it inside a human body for non-invasive surgeries. Uh, and it's because we're using a permanent magnets, magnetic field, it can essentially penetrate through most objects, including human bodies or, or drawers, like you said. And Adam, um, Adam IQ, uh, Adam's IQ. Um, yep. 
And if I say I have a software package that I want to use your uh, testing on, how much uh, information do you need and how do I provide it about what the software that I'm using is? Um, I assume that you need to know something about it, what I'm looking for, and yeah. I wouldn't clear that mechanism. Yeah, there are two things we need. We need the application itself. Uh, we could use a binary of the application, or we could use the code base if you want to share the code base. Code base is not a requirement, but definitely we need the application. That's the first thing we need. The second thing we need is some definition of what this application is about in, uh, in the form of requirements or uh, log files. We also have a machine vision component that allows you to observe uh, a user using the application and then determine what the functionality of the application is. And so those are the two inputs. Once we get it, we then form the state machine and then we build our models around it and then autonomously start testing it. And so how long would it take to do the testing for a software that you'd never seen before? What's the timeline so, for that? Uh, as, a, as a real world example, our product was used at Facebook and Amazon and we could scour and test the entire site in about three hours end to end. Um, so, you know, it can scale pretty quickly. Uh, we've sort of optimized the algorithms uh, very efficiently over the last 10 years since this, been, this has been, been working on from Berkeley and uh, Santa Cruz. And is, is there a size limit on the software? No, I mean, uh, we have worked with very complex code bases with over a couple of uh, tens of millions of lines of code. Uh, um, a lot of states, the state machine itself can scale uh, from a few nodes to a few uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of nodes. So it's, uh, it's a pretty scalable uh, piece of software that we've tested at, like I said, places like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera. And here Thank, you. Thank you. So our next judge is Ramona Travis. First question for LVX Systems, please. Since this is the NASA iTech competition, what do you see as some of the most likely challenges which you would face in implementing your system for use in space for NASA? whether that be our vehicles or other planetary surface? Well, so one of, one of the limitations is also the very reason we'd like to work with NASA and that's miniaturization. You know, our next step uh, is to go from a light fixture to uh, replacing tubes with lamps and replace ballasts with our ballasts. And NASA is gonna have this to do the same thing. So you got to have a lighting system in any kind of habitat, whether it's a building or in space, and miniaturization, energy efficiency, and uh, bandwidth, we, you know, we have the same, we have the same goals in mind. So um, the, the challenges primarily are, you know, mechanical and electrical, which are, are the same challenges that we're going to experience in space. Is that the same for other planetary surfaces as well? Have you thought about that? You know, um, some of the engineering people have, uh, I have not because again here we're, we're focusing on commercial applications and we would assume that with our swath of patents, our, our technology is suitable for licensing partners so that they can develop, you know, uh, different uh, devices for space and, and DOD applications because we're not a government contractor, but the, it's ripe for licensing operations, opportunities and collaborations. So I, I would see it as, as a beautiful relationship. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question for Autonom IQ, a pretty similar type of question. What are some typical, um, what, what have been some of the most significant challenges that you have faced in implementing your system? I'd like to understand where you've had your problems what keeps you up at night? It may be a wonderful system, but there are bound to be challenges that you have faced and things that you still face and keep you up at night. Yeah, so there are two things that we see uh, in terms of the limits of the product. The first one is more from a user perspective uh, where they want to deploy our product. Uh, we run on the cloud and a lot of times customers feel uh, that they cannot expose their internal product to our cloud version. So to solve that, uh, we just announced our on-premise version. So the product can now deploy behind the firewall 
uh, to be able to test uh, software that is uh, proprietary and, and customers don't feel uh, comfortable uh, exposing it to uh, to uh, with the cloud, essentially, from a security perspective. The second limitation is uh, we today don't work with uh, old mainframe legacy application environments. Most of our product is designed to test and validate uh, more modern application scenarios, web applications, mobile applications, and even complex systems that don't have an interface. However, we don't work with legacy, when I say legacy, things like mainframe and mainframe related technologies. So that's where the, uh, the, the, the limitations of the product are. So if, uh, if NASA is looking at testing mainframe based systems, then we have certain limitations there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there more that time, Robin? No, okay. that's it. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you. And our final judge, Terry Kilburn. This is for uh, Firehawk. Um, have you shown this to the big competition? Hello? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. The big competition is in other engine manufacturers or yeah, those in the yeah. defense and the big industry? Rocket, your, your, your big competitors uh, that are now, now putting rockets up in the air, like uh, up in space. They're so, not just going to roll over and to die. Uh, well, we're trying to be an engine manufacturer, not a launch, for, not a launcher. So our vision yeah, is provide the um, Yeah. Well, currently they're the, uh, they're they're still using the the, the typical liquid bi propellant rocket engine, and we're trying to break the biases that hybrid engines, which have been a goal for NASA in the private market to make high performance for decades now, are now right. uh, present the results that are achievable. We haven't presented it to any of these launchers. They're so invested in their own engines right, right now that uh, it just hasn't made sense. When do, you, when do you anticipate doing that? Well, we're working, to to start for, uh, we're working to provide our engines right now to a small stat launcher. We're, we're starting to uh, finish that deal up. We believe that once the world sees these engines work and these engines actually send small stats, that they'll start coming to us. Typically, a lot of these small launcher companies are having a hard time building their own rocket engines, so they're having to contract with these other companies. They take years to develop. Yeah. They take hundreds of millions of dollars, and once they see that our solution exists, we really think they'll come to us, and we'll still go after them as well. But okay, my 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 other question is for LVX. Um, you state that you can end hacking and jamming, which are two pretty nice features. How how real is this? How can you comment on that? Yeah, actually, um, light has physical properties that are very different from radio frequency or RF. So yeah. much, much of our limitations and our benefits uh, lie in that physical nature. So, for example, if, if you're going to if you're going to steal somebody's signal, you're, you're almost going to have to be t between them and their endpoint, which is virtually impossible to do undetected. And if you're going to jam it, you're going to have to overcome its conspicuity or its conspicuous nature. So you can see a candlelight outside on a bright day, that candlelight can still carry a very robust signal at that, at that intensity. So to overcome it or jam it, you'd have to be so bright that you couldn't see that candle. And that can't happen easily. And if it could, it couldn't happen undetected. So light by its very nature without doing anything provides us that extra security. Um, you know, and, and then geolocation in conjunction with the infrastructure you know, enhances it even farther. The other question I had in mind was, how flexible is the line of sight? Well, currently it's not as flexible as we'd like, um, but that's, the, that's not our low hanging fruit. If you think about it, 90% of all communication happens in a building and the bulk of every, of heavy streaming happens face to screen so that when you know when you're streaming texting emailing watching a movie you're looking at your screen and when you're looking at your screen that's really duck soup for connectivity so if yep. if we just handle the heavy lifting and the secure uh, communications bank transactions you know geolocation capabilities we really are enhancing 
and freeing up space for other forms. So the lights also can have speakers, cameras, microphones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, um, infrared for sensing temperatures on a person or who's got a weapon. You know, the infrastructure by itself pays for itself, so all these other services can be added. So there's there's additional security features that really have nothing to do with light, but just come free with the in, with the infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, judges. That okay. is time. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you. Great job. Um, so that concludes our judging Q and A. And um, if I could have our judges call in to the number that Robin sent sent to you, if you guys haven't called in already, so that we can um, we can actually join up and convene. But at this time, we're about to have our um, keynote speaker, which is um, Jim Reuter. He's the he's the um, space technology mission directorate for um, for space technology for the agency, and he's here to join us to kind of share with you sort of um, a little bit about our um, our offices, space technology, and the significance of technology and in, in innovation across the agency. So, if you guys can help me. Um, welcome, Jim. He's going to join us and speak, and I'm going to step out a minute and convene with the judges and um, and be on mute. So, talk to you guys in a second. Well, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a voice check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, once again, I really want to extend my welcome to everyone here. Uh, I was fortunate that I was able to get here a little sooner than I thought, so I basically made all the the, the presentations and the questions and answers, and, and this is really fun for me, so I really enjoyed it. Um, and I want to thank the presenters and the judges, and especially Kira and her team, for participating and, and pulling this off in, in really challenging times. I, I don't know about you, but it's great to have a sense of normalcy, um, and so even while uh, supporting things like shelter in place and other orders around uh, around our nation. Uh, and I re so I really appreciate being able to carry on an iTech Ignite the Night virtually. And even the night part is, is virtual since, since we're in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, so this is certainly not the same as being in Austin together and it's not ideal, but I really appreciate that we can communicate this way and, and really pretty effectively. Uh, you know, as part of the NAT, broader NASA community and family, uh, we really believe strongly in displaying resilience and perseverance. Uh, and that's evident in the uh, event today. You know, and you look at our Mars 2020 rover, uh, which is one example of, of something that is persevering. In fact, uh, the name that it w we recently uh, christened it with was Perseverance, which is um, ideally perfect in these times, and even though that name was selected before uh, coronavirus events. Um, and uh, so, but it's proceeding along. Um, it's got a July launch, and then if you miss that window, you miss you, you wait 26 months. So it's it's an area that that's continuing under these times, and and very successfully as as we're going forward. Um, we have four instruments ourselves on that mission. Um, what I would like to do is talk uh, a little bit about space tech responsibilities and 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 show how iTech fits into that. And so I think I have a chart um, if we can show it. Ah, thank you. So uh, this is our attempt to show our space technology portfolio. Um, and so what I like to say is the uh, strength of our organization is our breadth. Uh, we deal with technologies from the very low TRL, technology readiness level, early stage innovations there on the left, uh, through mid TRL where we're, we're demonstrating things in the laboratory, and all the way to high TRL, um, an eight or a nine where we're demonstrating the technologies in space and, and on missions as we go forward. Um, our early stage, uh, uh, we have uh, NASA Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program that, that basically does study, systems level studies. Um, we have a lot of space tech research grants um, and, and some early career initiatives that we're doing. Um, iTech fits in our partnership area um, and really spans a very broad range. Um, as you can see it there, along with our prizes and challenges. We run the SBR uh, program for the agency uh, we also run uh, tech transfer for the agency. Um, some of our technology maturations, uh, you know, and, and in demonstrations, uh, we have uh, a couple focuses, uh, a special focus on exploration, 
ensuring that we have the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon by 2024. Uh, have a sustainable, establish a sustainable presence on the lunar surface, including being a proven ground for Mars exploration and uh, feeding forward to Mars and beyond. Uh, as the technology office, then we're, we're looking at how do we get to Mars as, as we're also looking at how do we get to the moon. Uh, we have within the tech maturation area uh, established what we call a lunar surface innovation initiative, uh, which is to look at a variety of technologies um, in, in a variety of areas and demonstrate those on the lunar surface as we're going forward with both uh, commercial lander services and ultimately the human landing. Um, so, um, and then with that, like we, we like to say that uh, technology drives our exploration as we go forward. Um, and to give you a sense of, of the magnitude of what we deal with, um, our budget's a little over a billion dollars per year. Um, we deal, uh, we have, um, we evaluate over 3,500 proposals in any given year. Uh, we have over 700 awards, um, over 350 university partnerships with over 100 universities. We have over 1,000 active projects, over 400 industry collaborators. And if you kind of transition as somebody else funding after we're done, we've had over 900 of those um, over the last several years. So with this, what we really like to do is try to, to um, encourage innovation of all our programs. Uh, and you can go back to me, uh, that's okay. Um, and, and you know, we, I, I think Kira and her team are really most among the most creative at identifying innovative technologies and partnerships from the community that we really don't reach. So that, because um, we typically at this point, we haven't funded you at NASA for at least the technology that, that we have, uh, that we're discussing. Uh, but you do have uh, solve real world problems and there's potential for us for space applications from them. Um, we try to facilitate this innovation by encouraging a collaboration, uh, which is part I really love about this program. You, you get our chief, center chief technologists together with some industry experts, uh, the investors, investors and entrepreneurs yourselves, um, and bring together both public and private se sector into these uh, to solve a particular uh, problem that, in, that we can apply also uh, to uh, and repurpose for our problems in space. And so we don't have to invent um, everything when there's something already worked that we can just um, apply to our applications. And it's really that app interaction that we have in, in the, uh, with this diverse community that, that makes it fun for me. So I've always had a great time listening to all the, the presentations that are going on. Um, so, um, and so, you know, and, and one of the things I like about this is, is getting to see the the, um, the very broad range of activities that are being talked, and, and that's no example, uh, no exception here today. Um, the integrated photonics area for visible light communication is really a very promising next-gen field, um, and I, I really like to see that going forward. Uh, the 3D printing of, of the rocket fuel itself, along with the rocket engine, uh, is a very um, innovative concept um, that's, that's growing in interest as we're going forward. Um, having an automation platform leveraging AI, um, including self-healing uh, codes, uh, is exactly the sort of things that we need as we're looking for um, broadening, you know, even past the moon and onto Mars. Um, genetically um, engineering spir spirulina uh, algae for as bioproduction is an area I find fascinating um, as a platform for food, um, especially medicines and building materials as we go forward. Uh, the sixth off uh, magnet based tracking system was pretty cool. I like that. Performance fuel drinks for astronauts is, is, is interesting. Uh, the sensing elements with uh, AI-powered software analysis for anomaly detection and fault identification can have some real promising applications. And then the use of turbines, you know, for cost defense, effective renewable energy source. All, all these are really fun to see. I was glad I got to see the, the videos and I really appreciate everybody bringing their, their ideas and technologies forward. Uh, so, NASA's really, our missions do require us um, to advance technology and, and drive exploration. It's that technology that drives our exploration, our ability to do so. And so bringing the innovators together with our technical experts and entrepreneurs and industry leaders, we can really um, achieve some groundbreaking technologies uh, with, that also help a commercial market um, and, and help us overcome the challenges we all face. Uh, so with that, I, once again, I really want to thank everyone for your participation in very challenging times. It's the safety and well-being of, 
of our broader national, uh, national community that's of utmost importance. And we're really lucky that we have the capabilities to be able to come together um, through WebEx and other things as we're going forward. And so in a few minutes, I'm looking forward to hearing the results. So, so Jim, would it be okay, because we have the entrepreneurs on, and yeah. it's pretty unique that they would have an opportunity to ask a mission directorate at your, someone at your level, any questions like about technology since they're in the tech space, would you be open to doing a, a Q and A? And if you just can't answer the question, you could easily say I can't answer. But, but if they could, um, if would you mind if they? I mean, because technically you'll be able to answer any of the questions. I didn't mean it that way. I just mean if they ask something that might be proprietary, you know, <laughs> or something. Oh, I I think there's very distinct possibility and probability of this, that they'll be able to ask me questions that I won't know the answer to. That's but, not but I would true. Like to. <laughs> I've heard you talk technically. You're you're pretty sound there. So um, so if I could just offer that up for any of the entrepreneurs, I mean, this is an incredible opportunity that you would have to ask someone at his level, like any, you know, any questions as you're developing technologies for both a, a space and earth use. So I'm going to, um, get off the camera and then let the real star talk. <laughs> hey, uh, this is a question from Spira. I'm wondering what biotechnology related initiatives are uh, being kind of championed by NASA as a means of supporting life on other planets. Yeah, um, it's a great question. It's a very interesting area. And I, was, I found it really interesting listening to, to, to your use of spirulina. Um, we do have, uh, uh, as one example, we have what we call research institutes, um, and and what we do there is it's with uh, member uni with universities led PIs university. It's got to be a multi year multi university endeavor, um, and five years long. And then we give them like three million dollars a year. We gave them a topic. So a few years ago, one of the first one the first one of the two first uh, research institutes that we had was was really in biomanufacturing in space. Um, and so uh, Berkeley, it's a Berkeley-led activity for us, uh, and they're making very good progress. Um, they, they have um, been investigating some genetic engineering of, of really lettuce plants for production of, of things like um, uh, medications and stuff, and also looking at um, a food, you know, a base of a spirulina. Um, our own folks are, are complementing that with, we have a demonstration on orbit right now on, on ISS. It's a five-year-long a demonstration uh, of of really a new nutrient demonstrating um, the ability to store nutrients in uh, a nutrient mix in space in a stasis state, and then um, then activating it when we need so and providing a protein source. So uh, for this ex for this demonstration, we're bringing home uh, we're activating every six months uh, a nutrient pack that really is a bread yeast. Um, anyway, so we, we have activated on orbit, we freeze it, bring it back down and analyze it. And so that activity is going on as well to, to us, to help us understand on, on the multi-year missions to, to Mars, how we, can, uh, how we can take advantage of that. Uh, we also have, um, let's see, we have a prize challenge in mind along these lines. We haven't announced it yet, but, um, but we're looking forward to, um, uh, uh, well, and one that uh, that uh, for lunar nutrition for nutrition in space. That's that one's coming up fairly soon. Um, we're just kind of balancing with a couple other things, but within the next couple of months, anyways. Um, and we have one ongoing that's a um, uh, that's a, a CO2 conversion uh, to uh, to a sugar, a super, uh, glucose type competition that we're trying to, that we have active. Um, there's a bunch of other things too, I think, but those are the ones that pop up into my mind. And so, Jim, we have time for one more question. Jim, okay. Jeff from Neuro, Neuro Nutrition. Yeah, hi. Hi, hey, I'm just wondering, I'm really fascinated uh, by your interest in the nutrition and the biochemistry. Have you guys broken down the daily biochemistry of your athletes? And I'm, I'm really fascinated by the physical countermeasure, the treadmill, the bike, and the resistance training. Yeah. And looked at the impact of nutrient timing on top of your daily diet yeah it's a great question i wish i could answer it uh, <laughs> no um so part a lot of what we do with the astronauts is, is um especially on iss it's a great proving ground for that is done through the human research program um, and uh they're very interested in, in understanding nutrients and uh, the nutritional values and and the effects of of 
of um, uh, the, the effects of nutrients and, and exercise in their in their diet. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm sorry, I can't. I, I really don't know the, the specific answer to your question. This is Omo. Uh, this is Kay from Omo Technologies. Uh, so we do the precision tracking system, but obviously this is a component of a larger system rather than the uh, end user application, if you will. We need to essentially work with others such as NASA to develop uh, things like simulations, robotics control, uh, things like that. So would you say you would encourage companies like us to try to work directly with the NASA or is it better to work with uh, technology integrators such as uh, some of the defense companies, if you will? Yeah, that's a good question and I'm not sure there's one answer to it. Um, a lot of what you're doing, it fits very well with what our Ames Research Center um, uh, likes to apply. Um, this is the type of call that we put into our, our small business innovative research, but also as you, if you can get into a, a broader package or something from, from a supplier or a comp company, um, then that works as well. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say there's one right answer for this, um, but encourage you to, to uh, pursue multiple avenues. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Jim. Um, if you can sit tight for a second. Yeah. Sure, I look forward to the results. Uh, can I ask one question, if you don't mind? I was sorry, my mic was muted. Sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi Jim, this is uh, Sunil from NanoPrecise. And uh, so I, I went through a lot of RCM uh, reliability centered maintenance related documents for NASA's ground facilities, but I couldn't find anything specific uh, for NASA space facilities. So uh, does NASA have any RCM pro program for the space facilities? Certainly this is an area that's of high interest uh, to us um, as, as we proceed forward in, in space as well there. Uh, we did look at it um, as as we were developing the ISS to, to not to the extent that you guys have, but uh, as we went forward. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not sure where you found the ground uh, ground facility type application, which is kind of a natural first step. Uh, but we're definitely highly interested in it, as, especially as we go forward to to longer missions and farther from Earth. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to interject here, and I'm going to actually do this. Thank you, Jim. Okay, can we get a thumbs up for Jim's participation? Again, somebody at his level to have his participation and support it has been really incredible. And I haven't figured out how to pause that. And so uh, for all our entrepreneurs that got to engage with them, thumbs up, right? Thank you, Jim. You've been amazing. Um, the judges have finished convening and they have as always, it's it's always a little bit of a challenge to select the the entrepreneur and the winner for this. Um, what I want to say is, you know, just because you weren't selected as the top company for this for this particular ignite the night does not mean that you will not be. I mean, that you'll advance automatically and still be in the running for the forum. So when you think about it, if you have eight companies competing against each other, we can only select one for this to advance as a semifinalist. And so it doesn't mean that your uh, company wasn't in the running because trust me, listening to the arguments on there with the judges is usually pretty, pretty exciting, pretty interesting to see um, the companies that they select and it's always close. So um, I am going to, uh, so one, thank you for your time. I felt like we were, it wasn't exactly an Ignite the Night, but I still felt like we were a part of uh, something that was connected. And, and that I think that we all need that right now, but also very cool technologies to hear about what you guys are doing and how it can be a potential solution for us. That's always exciting for us. So you guys did a little extra work with having to send in your videos and things like that. And since it was our first one, I know everything didn't run perfectly, but I will say that I'm pretty proud of what the team has been able to do. It's been exciting to be a part of this. And I am about to pass it off to Harry uh, Partridge, our chief technologist out of Ames, 
who's going to um, share with you, I think, I've got to check to make sure Robin's ready, um, who the who the winner the winner is for this competition. So, um, Harry, uh, Robin, are you Robin? Are you ready? Yes. Okay, I'm going to pass it off to Harry. Then. So again, I'm Harry Partridge, and I'd like to congratulate all the participants in this. It was quite exciting, and um, all of the uh, presenters uh, got some score from the judges. And all the technologies have applications to NASA, and I hope to follow up with people and, and see if we can't follow the communication. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that the winner uh, was chosen was LVX. Um, it is an interesting technology. I like their thing, the fiber optics without the fiber. Um, it offers communications in space uh, that, that uh, has a number of potential applications, and we're really looking forward to seeing the developments of this technology to go forward. Again, congratulations, and LVX was our first. Thank you. I have to do my applause. <laughs> congratulations, guys. That's been great. So, I want yeah, to. Congratulations. Say, yeah, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And th thank you. Thank, thank you all for joining us. And uh, that company will advance as a semifinalist. So they'll automatically be in the top 25. Our next event, which we're going to have live as well, and we'll have judges that'll be run similarly, will be April 22nd. And so I hope everyone can join us then. But thank you for joining today. And we look forward to seeing you guys back. So thanks again, April 22nd. We hope to see you guys live stream then. Bye. Thank you. Great show, Kira. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you, everyone.